Okay, I guess we'll uh, we'll get going so we don't run out of time. So I'm going to kick off just with a bit of context uh, because just well because it's kind of fun. So this guy, I hope you can see him, uh, sort of washed out there, but a chap called Morris Wilkes, and I think has as good a claim as anybody to having been the world's first programmer, right? Because he was the first person to write code on a general purpose machine to do something other than just prove the experimental machine they were building worked, right? He was the first person to write what we think of as a program to do real work. And in his memoirs, he says he remembers this moment, which I think everybody in the room will probably be familiar with, which is that, that realization that he's going to spend a lot of his, the rest of his life finding and fixing bugs in his own programs. Because the term bugs and debugging hadn't been invented then. And I mean, I see a few sort of smiles around the room, and I, I certainly remember that uh, myself. And a little while ago, my daughter started programming in Scratch. And she said, you know, it's a lot of fun, but I have to do it an awful lot of times to get it to work, uh, which was kind of cool, because now like, she could understand a little bit about what this company with a funny name that dad started actually does. So kind of, you know, that was then, back in the 40s. Now nothing has changed. You know, if anything, the problems have just got much greater, right? So you know, we've, yes, the tools and everything have advanced, and the, you know, we write in high-level languages rather than sort of ones and zeros that I'm sure Morris Wilkes was doing back then. But you know, the, the order of the problem is just like exploding, right? And the modern machine is running billions of instructions every second. It's almost certainly talking to lots of other machines and lots of other processes. And if you kind of think about it in those, in those senses, I mean, it really is the ultimate needle in a haystack problem, right? And it's kind of surprising that we can ever fix anything. Right, or that anything ever works. Like people get frustrated with how sort of broken things are, but actually I think we do remarkably well, considering the degree of the complexity. But the way that we, you know, one of the ways that we do that and we handle that, obviously prevention is always better than cure, and there are lots of things we can do to prevent bugs in the first place, and that's like, you know, just to prevent that obvious uh, uh, criticism, that's always the, the preference. But whatever you do, shit happens, right? And you will need some cure. So what do we do when things don't work? You know, I mean, as, we, as, as Morris found and as my daughter found and as we all know, it never works first time, right? And, and, and more often than not, it doesn't work when you ship it. So what do we do to find that needle in a haystack? Well, we have various tools and techniques that we use from printf to, you know, defensive programming to stuff like coverity and all these things. I'm only going to talk about GDB today because uh, we only have an hour and it's like it's a, you know, it's a huge, con you could do a whole, uh, conference on, on just this stuff. And in fact, I'm only going to talk about sort of GDB uh, itself, right? Uh, so um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, there's, there's like a whole bunch of front ends and, uh, and, and things that are cool. You can see the stuff that, that we make uh, downstairs. We're here. You can come and get a demo of our stuff. I'm not going to do much of it here today. You can also get a very funky t-shirt like this if you want to. Uh, sea Lion people are here, uh, JetBrains, they have a nice front end onto GDB, that works with our stuff as well, I can also show you that. So there's a whole bunch of different front ends, Eclipse, and people use it within Emacs, people, I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff beyond what I've just said, we're just going to talk about GDB itself, right, and just look at the features that it has in itself rather than funky ways uh, to drive it. Uh, this is basically a kind of mishmash of stuff that I've, that I've collected over the years, right, so at Undo, you know, we, there's a whole bunch of interfaces actually onto undo. GDB is just one, but it's, it's probably certainly the most commonly used and the default one. And over the years, I've picked up like with customers and uh, you know, or just on my own, different kind of tips and tricks and things that work. I'm not, I'm no GDB guru, right? I'm sort of somewhere, I suppose, between newbie and guru. Uh, there will almost certainly be things that the people in the audience know that I don't know. Uh, I'm happy for this to be sort of slightly interactive, so you know, just. Like shout if, if you think there's something, you've got something to add, I've missed a bit or misled or, or you've got a question. Um, no guarantees I can answer any questions, but I'm happy to take them. GDB has come a long way in the last few years. Uh, I think probably, I mean, 10 years ago, certainly, uh, it was pretty basic and pretty flaky. Like it might work for you if you were lucky as long as you weren't doing anything super funky like, I don't know, threads 
or trying to attach to a program or whatever, right? But it's come a long way. That's changes both in, uh, particularly on Linux. So in the Linux kernel, lots of changes have been made that have made things better, and, and then there's been lots of contributions to GDB itself. So it's come a long way in terms of stability, I think, and robustness and just kind of working properly. Uh, it's also come a long way in terms of features. A lot of stuff has been added over the last sort of decade or so, and uh, that's kind of what this talk is about. Uh, one of the things where, where it's progressed quite well over the years is the documentation is pretty good. Uh, it's pretty complete, fairly well written, uh, and if you just type info GDB or you just Google for GDB info, uh, you'll get kind of fairly complete list of all the stuff, right? But as always with these kinds of things, it's about knowing what's there, right? So the, the purpose of this talk, I'm going to do a whole bunch of demos and, and we'll see things in practice because that's always more fun than slides. But I don't really expect, realistically, that people are going to remember all of the weird keystrokes and machinations and things that I've typed. But hopefully, you'll remember that these things exist so that when you need this in like a month, a year, whatever's time, uh, you can go, oh, yeah, I think I remember that, and go and look at the man page and figure out how, how it is that it works. Right? So it's just it's about knowing, knowing this stuff exists. Uh, so, I did give this talk here uh, last year, but it wasn't a proper talk, it was just a kind of lunchtime session, hence we're doing it again. Uh, if you did see it last time, I've got some new stuff, so hopefully there'll be a bit of a refresher and some, and some new stuff as well. Um, but some of it will be familiar. So I think, just following on from that point on the, on the documentation, uh, uh, GDB is very powerful actually, um, but it's certainly not intuitive. Right? And a lot of the kind of interface is built up over time, especially if you're used to a kind of GUI, kind of Visual Studio kind of world, it can be pretty painful. Uh, and I think it's, it's it full, I first heard this phrase said about VI actually, is one of those things, I think about Unix actually, one of those things that's it's not, ease of use is a misnomer, GDB is easy to use, but it's hard to learn. Right? Ease of use is not the same as ease of learning. Okay, now. This is probably where life gets a bit tricky because I spent about half an hour of panic earlier on because whenever I try to mirror my screen between here and there, my computer hangs, which is less than ideal. So there's going to be a certain amount of non-slick moving between, between slides and, uh, and, and, and demos, but just bear with me on that. So the thing that I think like, gets the both of the, 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 the scores highest on both fronts together of least well-known but most useful is this thing called TUI, Text User Interface. Very useful, very badly named, because GDB is always a text user interface, right? I mean, that's like one of the main reasons that it sucks. But let's just, let's just have a look at what, what we mean by that. So um, I'm just assuming, by the way, I should have checked, I should have checked before I started. Uh, has anybody not used GDB at all? We're all kind of, okay, cool. So at least no one's, no one's admitting to that. Usually people don't admit to using it. But um, So let me try and see if I can get my shell uh, up. All right. So I've had to do some magic, the mirroring of the shell, but we should be good. All right, so here is a program that is just a tiny bit more than Hello World. So we compile it in the normal way, right? You compile with dash G to put the debug info in, uh, and then we have our Hello World program, and we're gonna run that in GDB in the normal way. So GDB A dot out, my program starts. I can type start, just saves a tiny bit of typing. Rather than doing break main run, you can do start, which kind of puts a temporary breakpoint on main and, and runs it, so there we go. And like this is like the good old GDB interface that we all know, right? And and like the main problem I think with this is that you just lack context. We have a single line where we are, but you know, especially if you're navigating code that you're not super familiar with, which often when we break out the debugger, by the way, that's like the, one of its main jobs, right? Is is to help us understand code, and it might be to help us understand code that we wrote that's not do, not behaving as we expected it to. But more often than not, it's actually code that somebody else has written, and we're trying to just to understand like, what the whole thing does. And if you can only see one line at a time, then you know it's kind of lame. You know, we can type next, go to the next line, and so I can kind of see what line six and seven does. But it's still kind of lame. You can type list. List gives you a bit of context. 
Yeah, but you know, I still need to look. Okay, I'm at line seven, and I need to look at where line seven is on there, and it's just it's 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 not so good. It's not so good. Uh, uh, so here we are, a very kind of you know, certainly a text user interface. But this is called the CLI, right? The command line interface, not the text user interface, not TUI. Uh, TUI drags GDB forward, streaming from the 1970s to the 1980s. Uh, and I'm going to do, and I can switch between the two. You can do, you can do it at startup, or you can do it interactively. So if I go Control X A, I go da da, cursor's interface. Right. Now I can see that context, and now yeah, pretty it's not. Um, it's also not very reliable. Like as I just like completely contradict the earlier point I made. <sighs> Tui just, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just me, but it, it does break a lot. Sometimes you can recover. Sometimes you can toggle, so you can toggle between the two, right? So control X A again, and I toggle back, right? And sometimes you can toggle in and out with two E and it fixes itself. Sometimes you can do control L to get it just to repaint the screen and things go better. Sometimes it's just like, it's just broken and you have to stop GDB and start again. I've not figured out why, but I still like it despite all those caveats because it just gives you that context. And yes, you know, you can use better front ends, right? Like Eclipse or Sea Lion, or you can use it from Emacs or whatever and get that context. But it's not always so convenient, right? You have to kind of have a whole bunch of stuff around you to do that. Whereas, you know, you could be SSH'd in somewhere to some server somewhere that's like a minimal server and, and you can still do this stuff, right? So it's still useful. Uh, and, and so when I, t I type my normal kind of commands, so when I type next, it goes next. Now, I said that it can be a bit flaky, uh, and unfortunately, it's one of those things that's unreliably unreliable. So I haven't found a demo yet that causes, reliably causes TUI mode to mess up. But you can see the beginning of kind of what's happening here. Right? This isn't really messing up. This is just fair enough. My program has printed hello world, and, and hello world has appeared kind of slightly messing up my, my, my TUI, right? And now, okay, that's only hello world. We can live with that. It wasn't pretty in the first place. It's kind of bearable. Um, but obviously, if your program is doing more stuff, but printing more stuff to the screen, it can get pretty trashed. Uh, and so often, not necessarily always, but often I can just type Control L and it repaints the screen. Right? And that can be helpful. Um, what else can we do? We can actually, it's got, you can actually split it into two windows. So if I go Control X2, sorry. no, I can't because I'll tell, tell you what I think this is probably. I'm, I've got this weird split screen thing. No, it does. Okay, all right. So Control X2 gives me two windows. Obviously, I've got the source at the top and I've got the disassembly there. If I do Control X2 again, I can cycle through them. Now, this is quite a useful view if you're ever unfortunate enough to be debugging something that you don't have the source for. All right. So now I can see the registers and and the disassembly at the same time. Um, and I can kind of cycle through them if I go Control X2, come back, Control X1, get back to the screen. One thing I find in, 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 in TUI mode, just took me a little while to figure out, um, is I think we all use um, the up and down arrows to go, to go through the command history, right? Because there's typing and we want to type the same thing again. But when you do that in TUI, if I hit up arrow, it just moves my source around. Which is like really tedious, but um, I then discovered that you can do Control P for previous, and I can get my previous command. So Control P and Control N, which kind of works anyway, a normal GDB CLI. But I never, I didn't know that. I was just doing up and down arrow. And if you're in TUI mode, you need Control P, Control N to get your two previous commands. Um, so that's handy. So try unslickly. Slides. Uh, all right, so I'm going to just do this messily. I think this isn't going to be pretty. But so I think we've we've covered everything there. So Control X A is probably the main one. Go to and from. You can do GDB dash TUI when you start GDB, and it will just jump into TUI mode or TUI mode. But um, you can always do that. Control A, X A to switch between them. And I went through the other things there. All right, next up, 
and this is a few years old now, but very useful, very powerful actually. GDB has a Python interpreter in it, and uh, it's it's pretty complete. So if I come back here, so uh, and this is since like version seven, I think, um, which is a few years old now. So I can do Python, and then I can just type a line of Python here. So I could type, I don't know, print hello world. Print hello world, right? But it's quite complete. As I say, you can do most things. So um, I can actually type a small Python script. Um, right, I'm going to come out to UI mode because it makes it clear what's going on. Hang on a minute. Uh -oh. That was my fault. That was a finger problem. Anyway. So, so Python, I can type a few lines of Python here, and you can like import all the standard uh, libraries, and I can go, I don't know, I am running on PID. Like that, there you go. And the reason I'm showing you this is two things. One, getting the PID of GDB is not often that useful, can be handy. Uh, but just to kind of demonstrate that this is not, this is not you could, there's also the shell command from, 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 from GDB, right? So I can do shell, uh, and then I can run anything from, from my shell, right? Um, and so if I say run shell ps, what that does is forks a subprocess, runs, runs bash in it, runs ps, does the output, and then returns the GDB prompt. And when I'm doing Python, it's not like forking a Python process and going running that stuff. It's running it from within the GDB process itself, and that's quite useful for a reason we'll see in a bit. So you can see that here, right? So if you see, I've gone shell PS, so I've looked, so I've got my GDB process there, 6243. And if I look at the output, I am running on PID 6243. It's within, it's within the process. And the second reason I wanted to show that import OS thing, other than just to show that you can do it, is in my experience, this is the most common way I've seen screwed up GDB installations out in the wild. Because it's, it's like that worst, that worst thing of uh, mostly working, right? So, so when, when you compile GDB from source, it's fairly straightforward to compile as you'd, as, you, as you'd hope these days. It needs a bunch of packages that you need to install, but once you've done that, you know, configure, make, does the usual thing. And it makes a GDB executable that's mostly pretty self-contained. So you can copy that GDB executable you know, from your workstation onto your server or your target or wherever it is and just use it, right? And it mostly works and that's good. Except the Python modules stuff will almost certainly all be broken either subtly or catastrophically, if you're unlucky, subtly. Um, and, and so because what happens is, it, you, when I go import OS, it's importing the OS Python module from my computer, right? And if that doesn't version match with the, GD, with the Python that's built into your GDB, you'll get weird problems. And it doesn't like happily tell you, oh no, version mismatch. It just kind of, like depending on how different the, 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 inst, the, the distro you're running on is from where you compiled it, it'll work somewhere between you know, just a few things being broken to nothing working at all. So that, I think, is the most common example I've seen of broken GDB installs out there. So if you start to use the Python stuff, be aware, if someone's compiled GDB on a different machine, it probably won't work for them. Now, there is a way you can jump through some hoops to build a version of GDB that's like self-contained and has a directory that has all the Python stuff in it. Uh, and that's actually what we ended up being forced to do at, at, at Undo to get around this problem. Okay. What's next? Um, so, yeah, so, so, sorry about this. All right, so, uh, where are we? So, yes. Um, Oh, that's right. Sorry. Yeah. So, right. So, so it has uh, uh, the the, GD, the Python built into GDB is more than just a Python because it has this really useful module that you can import called GDB, which gives you pretty tight binding between the Python and the GDB. Now, this is something that it was released in version seven of GDB, um, but that was kind of 
like version one, if you like, of the Python integration with GDB, and it got better over the subsequent versions. I think by about version 7.6 of GDB, I think the kind of pace has slowed quite a lot because most of it's done, right? So early versions of, you know, if you've got GDB 7.0, it'll have Python. Some of the integration with GDB is quite limited. You know, all the, all the, there's not, not all the features are there. Um, if you have 7.6, 7.7, it's pretty complete. Anyway, let me show you what I mean by that. So, um, so I'm going to go back into to UI mode just to make this a little bit clearer. So if I go Python, so now I can just type some Python at it, right? I can go gdb.execute. And what that does, that takes a string, and that string is just a gdb command to run. And so when I hit enter here, ta-da, goes next, right? Pretty cool. Uh, so you can now start to imagine how you can script pretty powerfully, uh, you know, debug whether it's been something inside a test suite or maybe you've got some intermittent failure that, that, that happens only very rarely. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, you know, you, you can script it quite quite nicely, um, but it's more than just having that that like CLI interface onto on, on, onto onto GDB. You can actually interact with GDB through the Python, right? So for example, if I go uh, Python BP equals, so I'm going to create uh, an instance of the breakpoint, uh, GB breakpoint class, and you give it the usual kind of uh, line spec. So if I file name colon line number, let's put it on line nine. So if I do that, I'm going to create an instance of the GDB breakpoint class. It's going to uh, be bound to the, the value, uh, the identified BP. Uh, and if you watch on the on the top here, as of when I hit enter, my breakpoint has appeared. Right, so I now have a breakpoint there. Uh, I can now control that breakpoint. Right, so I can go. Now, well, another thing to notice is, by the way, when you create a variable in the Python, it's kind of long lived. It's a global, so that's that BP variable there is still there. So I can do another Python script, and I can see it. Uh, and I don't know, we can go enable equals false. All right, if you watch where that breakpoint is, when I hit enter, it's now disabled. Uh, you can, it's pretty complete. You can like attach commands to it. You can do all the kind of pretty much everything I think you would normally do, conditions, all the rest of it on the, on the breakpoint there. And I can, I can look at the breakpoints um, with, I think I go, uh, try to remember this. Um, okay, let me go back out of TUI mode just because it gets a bit clearer. Uh, so print. Um, yeah, so uh, I've, I've got BPs is actually a, a list of all the breakpoints. I only have one there. So there's a list of one, well, it's a tuple anyway, one thing. But, but then I can, so I can go uh, uh, Python print. BP zero dot location. Okay, so I can interact with my breakpoints. Um, I can also interact, and, and you know, obviously, watch points and all the other kind of cool things in, in GDB. I can also interact with the program that I'm debugging and its state, right? What GDB calls the inferior, uh, and so I do that using this parse and eval thing. So let's go back to you, I'm as you can see where we are. So, all right, so I have a local variable here, i, which I can tell from code inspection is gonna have the, the value zero, but let's pretend it's not so obvious, so I can do the usual GDB thing, print i, there it is. Um, in the Python, I can just write some Python now, and I can say, um, I don't know, I'll call it, Something different just to make it a bit clearer what's going on. Bar i equals GDB uh, parse and eval, right? And to parse and eval, I now give it a string, which is a bunch of C code. Or well, actually, I think technically whatever language my program is written in. And GDB will parse it and evaluate that expression. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to do that, right? So the expression is very simple. It's just going to get the value of i, and it's going to bind it to that Python uh, variable. So now if I go Python print 
the RI is. Uh, and, and clearly I could you know, do bucket follow pointers and operator overloading and all the usual stuff there. Uh, if I um, do next a couple of times, now when I, ne when I hit next again now, of course, I is going to increment. Fine. If I control P to get that line again, It's going to, var i is not bound like dynamically to that variable i, right? I did, I called pars and eval some time ago when i was zero. So if I look at var i, it's, it, it's still zero, right? It doesn't change when my, when my debuggy state changes, so just be aware of that. But, you know, obviously I can just pars and eval once more, and that was updated. There's lots to that. Read demand pages or the info pages rather, uh, and and you can see there's there's lots of uh, there's lots of Python. There's one other thing I'm going to show uh, in, in in a minute, but we'll come back to that. Okay. So, oh yeah, no, the other thing, uh, the inbuilt help is quite useful. So um, I find it useful anyway. So I often do um, Python. Uh, let's come out of TUI mode because it can get a bit messy. Uh, Python, you know, you can do the online built-in help with Python, right? Uh, and it will give you the doc documentation for the objects. So if I go Python help GDB, it gives me all of the documentation for the Python module. So you can see everything that's there. And you can see there's actually quite a lot of stuff, right? Um, and then there's all these classes. So, and obviously we can do the usual thing, like I can just want to find more out about breakpoint, then there's all the stuff in the breakpoint class. So I find that quite useful. It is all in the info pages as well, but it's always nicer just to get it from where you are. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Um, okay, yeah, so the other thing I was going to show on Python is the pretty printers, which is... Uh, definitely falls into that not easy to learn. I'm not sure they're that easy to use, but they're quite useful. So, um, so, you know, we often have data structures that are complicated, right? And, and, and we have ways to visualize them that are kind of make life easier. And often what people do is you might have a pretty printer function that you call from the GDB command line, right? And that kind of works. So let's 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 show that. Um, show what I mean. So I'm going to do a new program here now. I'm going to do uh, this one. So I have a pretty simple program. Oh, I should have given this apology at the beginning. A, a, ter a terrible uh, confession. I'm not really, a, you know, a huge user of, of, of C++. I tend to do more kind of kernel lower level stuff. So most of my examples are in plain old C. Um, but anyway, whatever. Uh, so um, I've got this structure, right? It's not very complicated, but you know, it's complicated enough to show the demo. So I'm going to compile that. I'm going to run it in GDB. Uh, start. Uh, let's go forward a few lines. Right, so now ST has been initialized. So if I print st, student, there's my structure. Right, everything's there. This is not so complicated that you can kind of deal with it. But obviously, you know, the more complicated your classes and your you know, data structures get, the more, the, the less readable that becomes. I quite like, and actually I usually do this for my GDB init file, I quite like uh, set print pretty on. I just find that slightly easier to read. Um, but, you know, it's still not like super easy to read, right? I need to figure out what that time spec is telling me. Uh, now my program has uh, in it a do have a, a, a pretty printer thing, dump students, 
which printed in a better way. So I can just call that, right? So uh, hang on a minute, where are we? So I can call dump student. Right, that's okay, good. Um, I can, I think I've just realized there's a problem with my pretty printer, but anyway, you'll, that's fine, we'll, 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 we'll overlook that. Right, so that's, that's fine, okay, but the problem is I'm calling a function inside the inferior, which you may or may not want to do, right? If you're debugging something where your data structures are all screwed up, calling functions in the inferior that walk over your data structures is very probably a bad idea. You know, you, you, you're, you're, you're debugging, so probably all bets are off. Uh, so calling functions in the inferior, you know, kind of, it's a bit dodgy. Probably don't want to be doing it. So I can do with, with, with these Python pretty printers, I can do a bit better. So uh, I've made a Python pretty printer for my student structure. Now, it is a bit fiddly. There's quite a lot of boilerplate code to write. Um, but, you know, it's pretty useful, right? And it's flexible. It's powerful. You can kind of do what you need to do. So we've got a bunch of Python here. You kind of create a class. You bind that class to uh, a type given a regular expression. So this is my, th this is my, um, uh, my, 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 my pretty printer class, of course. So I've just got this two string function, usual kind of Python stuff, and, and it walks over this, this, this value that I've given it in a constructor, and it's like a dictionary, and, and I can look up all of the, 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 the members of the structure in the dictionary like that. Um, and, um, and then I need to do this sort of bite boilerplate stuff that's pretty painful, but easy enough to copy paste. Uh, and, and this is the bit here that binds it to a regular expression, as I've just said, any type that is called exactly student, I'm going to bind it to that. But obviously, you could be a bit more flexible, particularly with, you know, if you've got C++ uh, classes, uh, you know, class uh, hierarchies and things, that could be quite useful. Um, and so now I can source that, right? So if you remember, when I go print stuff, I've said print pretty on, so it's kind of a bit clearer, but still not great. If I source pretty pi, now I print it, print it in a pretty way. Um, so that's kind of useful. Uh, oh, one other thing while I'm here. So, uh, and what they've done with the um, like with the uh, uh, STL and other libraries, there's a bunch of pretty printers like installed by default. So if you print iterators and stuff like that, then you can get kind of nice output. Um, and it's kind of the way, you know, rather than hacking into GDB itself, all of this kind of knowledge of, of, of libraries and everything else, they've just got the pretty printers in the distro. Yeah. Can you just show the Python code again? I just, yeah. Does it bind to the print part of GDB? Uh, okay, hang on a minute, let me get that back. Uh, so I've been asked to show this again. And sorry, yeah, the question is? Oh, right, that's, that's what Python pretty printers do, right? So the Python pretty printer is kind of, that's, so, sorry, I should repeat the question. So how come the Python stuff gets invoked when I just type print at the GDB command line? Right, and, and that's, that's, that's kind of, that's what it is. That's what the inbuilt GDB Python pretty printers do. So they kind of override the Python print command. So it's a way to hook that Python print. Sorry, let me say that again because I, said the wrong word, which is doubly confusing. It hooks the GDB print command. So when you type print in GDB, the command is hooked because of that, because I've added that pretty printer. So now GDB, instead of doing what it would normally do to print something, it goes and calls my Python that I have defined, and it returns a string in that nice way that I define the printer, the, the, the Python to do. Yes, yeah. I'll be honest, you can probably tell, I just copy-pasted this until it worked. So it may be, it may be possible to do it more simply. Uh, 
but yeah, so this is just so that the the those those so essentially what you're doing is you have to create one of these uh, pretty printer objects, um, which well, so first I've defined the class. Uh, and then I've created that uh, an object of the pretty printer and bound it to that class, uh, and and then I've bound it to every type that matches that regular expression uh, uh, of student. But yeah, I'll be honest. I copy pasted it from the interwebs and it works. Does it work with templates? Like Does it work with templates? Uh, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, I would have thought so. So, so the question is, could we uh, could we like invoke other logic and things and 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 in order to kind of, um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's pretty. It's, it's just Python, right? So you can do what you need to do in the Python, and you can bind back in to the GDB, you know, Python binding stuff. So. I mean, I've not done exactly what you asked. I've not like, caused it to do an X when I'm doing a print. I mean, I'd, and I'd advise against it. I'd advise against making it so that print causes side effects. Um, but, you know, I think you have got enough rope to shoot yourself in the foot with there if that's what you want to do. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just like call print and you do all the logic that you need for where you want to debug exactly. Yeah, you, you, you get. Yeah. No, you, I think, I think it's, you, you could do it. Like I say, I'm, I'm, I would. I think, there, and I'll come to it actually. But you can, you so the other thing you can do, is you can. It's not just print actually. You can hook. You can create your own commands in Python, and that you can then just type at GDB, and it will just go off and execute your your, your bit of Python. You can either hook existing commands, or you can create your own. Um, and I, I would probably recommend doing that rather than if you're going to do more than just print values out. If it's going to actually move around and change the state in the debuggy, I would advise. But you create a new command to do that because if it doesn't confuse you, it'll probably confuse somebody else later on if you're doing that. But I mean, you know, I'm, it's uh, that's who am I to say, right? Um, okay. So, all right. Okay, uh, so we're going to do some different stuff now, which is uh, reversible debugging, which is kind of a subject that's uh, close, uh, close to my heart. Um, and um, but I'm just going to show inbuilt GDB reversible debugging because it's pretty good at what it does, and really what it's just to you know show why why it's useful. So you know, if you, as I mentioned before, debugging is really all about thinking how did that happen, right? A, 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 Brian Kernighan and Rob Pike in their book Practice of Programming they talk about debugging very totally in terms of backwards reasoning, right? And and thinking back from the failed state to kind of figure out how you got there. And most debuggers just let you step forwards, which is like, you know, if it would be really useful to step backwards, is stepping forwards the opposite of useful? It's probably a bit harsh, but but it, it you know it's, it's not necessarily what you want. Um, so we want to be able to go back and see what happened rather than like guess what happened, which is what we normally do when we're, when we're debugging. Uh, and this is particularly useful with intermittent bugs. So let me show another little demo here. I can just do that. Right. So here is my um, my program. What's that? Is this one? Yeah. Right. Um, so it's a bubble sort, right? Uh, does uh, what you'd what you'd expect. So you know it's pretty pretty minimalist. Just got an implementation of a bubble sort, and I get some random data, and then I sort it. And uh, I've pre-compiled it here. Actually, let me just make sure I got the right one there. So um, da -da -da, now I'm going to assume I have. So if I run it, it doesn't actually do anything. But I happen to, all it's doing is sorting the random data, getting random data, and sorting it. But I happen to know that there is a an intermittent bug in, in this. And if I run it a bunch of times from the shell, which I'll just do with just a little bit of shell. Okay. Uh, if I could remember that. So as long as this is the one I think it is. So 
necessary, run it a bunch of times, and every so often, that happens. We've all been here, right? So it's dumped a core file, so that's something, that's good. Let's have a look at the core file. Um, I've got a bunch of core files, let's uh, get them, this one. So it's this one here, 26529. So I'm gonna go GDB uh, minus C. This is like one of the most common things I think GDB is used for is to look at core files. Uh, if you do, um, so you can see the backtrace guys just behind us here who, who have better ways to do this kind of thing, but we're just using regular GDB here. So, um, so, so I load up the core file just with, with, with dash C. Um, in older versions of GDB, you needed to give the executable name, but the executable name is stored inside the core file, so it'll just find that for me. And, and all right, I've got a segv, uh, and there doesn't seem to be any code there. So well, let's have a look. Where are, where are, where are we? So print, uh, well, I could print the program counter like that. You can see I'm at that address. Well, actually, it just told me that. It's a bit of a waste of time. Uh, the x command uh, in GDB lets me examine memory. If I do $1, that's going to refer back to this value here, right? Uh, sorry, you can't, you can't see that. Can you? If I do $1, it's going to refer back to the, the, the value there. So, so x dollar one is going to examine memory at that address o x five a four blah blah blah. Only that address does not exist. So my program has branched into hyperspace. Um, let's see what else. Well, probably the most common thing you do in when 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 loading a core file is get a backtrace, right? Because backtrace is like the closest, really, that most debuggers get to directly answering that question of how did I get here? How did that happen? And, and you know, it's just based on what's in registers and what's in memory, and it can kind of walk the stack and give you a bit of a, a guess, basically, of how you got here. But that guess is usually either correct or obviously wrong. And in this case, it's obviously wrong. So there's garbage on my stack. I've smashed my stack, it looks like. Uh, and so, like, how did I get here, right? I've, got, I've just got nothing to go on. And in, in real world, you know, I mean, this is a simple, small program, so you can just kind of probably stare at it for long enough and you'll, and you'll see the bug. But, you know, you're working on a real world code base of millions of lines of code, and you get this occasional problem. What, what are you going to, you've got, you've got nothing, right? You might have some log information somewhere, but that's probably a long time ago. Um, very hard to debug. So what I'm going to do is use a little bit of funky scripting and, um, and, and GDB's reversible debugging to do a bit better. So I'm going to load it into, into GDB. Um, so GDB reverse debugging. So since version 7, it's had this feature reverse debugging. If I start the program, uh, I can enter this command record. And now when I continue, Everything that the inferior does, this isn't, this isn't recording my interaction with GDB, this is recording what the inferior does, right? So when I continue, everything the inferior does is going to be recorded, right? Program's run, and it stopped. Well, it's not a surprise. It, it, we know it works most of the time, and this was one of those occasions when it worked. So that's not really helped me. So what I need to do is script this so that I run it a bunch of times with the recording on until it fails, and then I can see like, what happened, right? So the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to add, I'm going to put a breakpoint at, ma at main. I'm going to put a breakpoint at underscore exit, which is the where it goes through when everything finishes normally. I'm going to, I'm going to hook some commands off of that. So you can hook a series, a sequence of commands to execute every time a breakpoint is hit. Right? Breakpoints all have these these low, typically small numbers that you can reference them by. So I created a breakpoint at main, which is breakpoint two. And I created a breakpoint to underscore exit, which is breakpoint number three. So if I go command two, that gives me a list of commands that we will automatically execute when breakpoint two is hit. So the first command I'm going to tell it to do is to enable the recording. And the second command is just to continue. Right. And now I'm going to add commands to breakpoint three, which is the exit point, which is actually just to rerun the program, right? So, so it's going to ping pong between these breakpoints. Get to breakpoint three, which is normal exit, run it again. Get to start, enable recording, continue. I get to the clean exit, repeat. Uh, I've also hacked this to turn off um, uh, pagination and confirmations and things, so that makes it a bit easier. So if I just run, 
Here we go. Oh, it didn't take very long. That was lucky. Often you have to wait quite a long time for this. It ran out a, bunch, a few times, and now it's stopped. It didn't get to the end point. Um, so backtrace looks much like before. My stack is messed up. Uh, so I have limited information on how I got here. Um, but now I can do something a bit better, right? Now I can go reverse step I. So step I in GDB will step you forwards one machine instruction. So reverse step I will step you backwards one machine instruction, which if I do that now, da -da, I've gone back into sensible land, right? I'm back into my, into my code here. Let's, let's go into... Um, Okay, so I'm at the return statement from main. So, you know, all signs point to sp stack smashing. Now, I still need to figure out how did that happen, right? How did my stack get smashed? Um, well, let's have a look. I mean, first of all, let's just, let's just make sure that I'm, I'm correct. Um, so, sort for disassembly gives me disassembly of the current function. I can see in that little arrow at the bottom tells me the, the machine instruction I'm on. And sure enough, I'm, I'm on a return instruction, right? So I've gone reverse one instruction. It's gone back to a re machine return instruction. Now, what x86 does when it returns is it uh, fetches the, 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 the stack pointer points at the actual return address, right? So I can look at the stack pointer like that. And then I should be able to um, look at, at what's there. So examine that. Um, actually, that's, uh, I think I need to get it back. I actually, no, that wasn't what I do. Right, I'm going to do this. The, I can't remember how to do that. I'm going to just cast it to a long star star, and, uh, and we'll look at it. We'll look at it here. So, um, is that valid memory? No. Right? So, the cop of the, it's a different address since last time, because it's kind of a non-deterministic bug, but the top of the stack contains a pointer to invalid memory. Hence, when I execute that return instruction, it's going to blow up. Right? But once again, how did that happen? Right? How did I get here? How did my top of my stack contain, get to contain bad data? Well, you know, I could do a few things. I could maybe do a binary search and time, jump back and forth, try and find what's gone wrong. But we can do a bit better. We can use a watch point. Right? So watch points uh, typically used when you go forwards. And it hooks into the hardware, usually, to run forward until a particular variable changes value. But I can do those in reverse as well, which is super cool. So, which I do like this. So, uh, so I want to watch the top of the stack. Top of the stack is uh, that 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 dollar one. So if I go watch, probably the simplest way to do it is that, right? And that's going to watch that location in memory. Actually, what I could have done is watch dash L, uh, probably done that, and that probably would have done, sorry, dash, not dash P, dash L, the location, that would have done the same thing. So just be aware with watch points, you're watching an expression, not a value in memory, which if you're debugging memory corruption bugs, often you're just looking at that value of memory because like it's some aliased pointer or something else that's the or buffer overrun or something. Um, so the watch dash L actually just watches the address. If you watch the expression, it kind of tries to be clever and when you go out of scope, it'll disable the the, 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 the the expression. And if you if you're watching something that might change, like a register, if your expression is based on a register, we'll have to do a software watch point. Don't have time to get into that, but um, uh, it's in the slides. Anyway, I've put a watch point on the top of my stack. So now when I reverse continue, if I didn't have stack smashing, what I would expect to happen is I would go back to the call site or the very beginning of main, because that's when the return address should get pushed, right, just before, just when main is called. But as I, as I think I've got stack smashing here, it's probably going to happen sooner than that. So reverse continue, and sure enough, what are the chances? It's in my uh, array assignment. Um, so I'm assigning to the array, and I seem to be overwriting the return address of my stack. Print i. Well, i is 33. 
uh, I can go, what is array? And it tells me that an array, uh, that array is, a, is, is an array of 32 longs, and I've just indexed the 33rd entry. Um, why have I done that? Well, I can see here I've got percent size of. So of course, here's the problem, right? So size of array is the size in bytes, not the size in elements. So, you know, schoolboy error. Um, but you know the, the 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 point is clear enough, right? So by 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 using that a little bit of scripting and the GDB inbuilt recording, we were able to go back and see what happened rather than have to try and guess. And particularly with non-deterministic intermittent failures like that, that's that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. Yes, a couple of questions here. Could you uh, look at the core file and go back? Could I look at the core file and go back? No, because the core file has like the information, when the, the reason this is hard, when the program is running, the computer is running, it's destroying information all the time. Every time it writes to a memory location or to a register, what was there before is gone. So in a core file, that information physically has been destroyed. It does not exist anywhere in the universe. Um, so, so yeah, now you can, there are things you can do. You could use our live recorder product, which gives you kind of a core file, but with that, historical information, right? So that then enables you to do what you want to do. Um, and uh, another plug for the backtrace guys who are just behind who who do stuff that's kind of core file debugging, but extra stuff in it, basically. Um, but yeah, you can't do reverse continue off of a core file. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you say that. Let's just do that again. Um, I'm going to enable record, continue. This is a very, very small program, right? And But watch. Oh, I've got my watch points set. Let me remove the watch points. Continue. It took like half a second to run, right? Because what it's doing underneath is it's single-stepping instruction by instruction. So... Uh, it runs, I mean, it depends on the test case, but typical kind of measurements for that are the slowdown when you've got recording compared to native is about 50,000 times slower. So you kind of need, the problem with inbuilt GDB reverse debugging is you kind of need to be able to put a breakpoint quite close to where it's going wrong and then enable the recording. If you know how to do that, you kind of, you know, 90% of the way there already. But that said, you know, it does get used, right? And I do know people who use it particularly when trying to understand someone else's very clever code. Um, you know, if someone's been very smart and tried to optimize something, it's, it's quite good. It's also very, actually, it does make debugging machine code like almost doable because um, you kind of get, it's the trouble with debugging machine code, you get very lost very easily and you can go back to where you were. And, and, and so it, it, you know, it, it definitely has, has use cases. Um, but there are other alternatives. Um, other alternatives? No, they're just our alternatives, aren't they? Anyway. Um, at least there would be. There we go. So, show you some of these. So, talk a bit about these. So, there is, uh, there's, a, there's a number of things, right? And this, this list probably isn't, it, well, certainly isn't exhaustive. It's, this, this is evolving all the time. There's quite a lot of these technologies coming around now. Uh, so, there's inbuilt reverse debugging, which we just saw. Uh, inbuilt to GD, in build in built to GDB is, is, also, is on. If you're running on a newer Intel CPU, you can go record, what's it, record, uh, uh, record B trace, yeah. And that uses, there's, there's silicon in the newer Intel CPUs that will like st cause it to store the targets of all the branches as it's running in memory, and GDB knows how to drive that stuff. Uh, and so that's kind of cool. Uh, it runs much faster than inbuilt GDB record, still surprisingly slow. Uh, measurements that I've done, it's about 100 times slowdown, which is surprising. I think the newer CPUs are much better. Um, and, uh, but, it, it, you know, it, it, um, it, it's kind of much more usable in that sense. However, it only gives you a history of where the program counters have been. So you can do reverse next, but you can't look at the program state. So, I mean, you know, that's useful, but it's 
not as useful as being able to see the program state, and you certainly can't do things like watch points and go back and stuff, right? So it's not really reversible debugging in a sense, but it is a kind of log of where you've been. Um, you do need a new enough Intel CPU, although it goes back a few years now, and a new enough kernel. Um, there's another thing called RR, which stands for record and replay, uh, which is much faster. That's the fastest option, actually, that you have. Um, depends on the benchmark, but typically they run like less than 2x slowdown. Um, and that gives you full data visibility, all of the things you can do uh, uh, in GDB reverse debugging, and so it is quite is pretty powerful. Um, it is a little bit limited, though, in terms of both platform support and um, uh, and also kind of features. Uh, so, so it's kind of separate record replay step. It only works on newer Intel CPUs. Doesn't work on AMD. Doesn't work on ARM. Uh, need quite a new kernel as well. Um, but you know, if you've got all of those things and, and it works, it, it works very well. It doesn't support programs that do shared memory. It's probably its biggest limitation. Um, but yeah, if it works, it works well. All you've got on DDB from us, which is perfect. It's all of the above. Works with very good performance. Works across the platform. You don't need special kernels. You could work with ARM, does all those things. So DDB is wonderful. Uh, but it is expensive. But you know, get what you pay for. Um, how are we doing for time? I think we're getting towards the end now, which is a shame. I could go on for ages, but just just one, maybe time for a couple more quick things. GDB init files. This is my GDB init. Uh, I find this quite useful. One word of caution, don't be too clever in your GDB init. The second most common problem we find with customers' GDB installations is somebody somewhere put like a run command in their GDB init file because they were too lazy to type R, enter. Uh, each time, and that just causes, like, you know, just confuses people. At some point, it will confuse you or somebody else. So keep the GDB in it simple. That's that's all I do in mine. Um, yeah, I, I've, 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 I've run out of time. We could definitely do a part two to this, um, but you know, I think we've seen. I've kind of put this in order, but let me just. Better if I didn't have to do this remote debugging multiprocess. Yeah, so you can debug multiple processes at the same time. That's very cool. Uh, non stop mode. You can debug while other threads run, although that's the most reliable way to make GDB segv in my experience. Um, breakpoints and watch points do more than you might think. So you can watch like thread specific breakpoints and watch points. You can put conditions on them, which is kind of useful. You can have read watch points if the hardware supports it. One last word of warning, well, and then I run out of time. Um, uh, GDB sometimes sets, this is the third most common problem that I've seen in practice, GDB sometimes sets uh, software watch points and doesn't tell you that it's, well, it does tell you that it's done it, but it's not obvious. So if I start that program again, you can watch like more than you might imagine. So I can watch all of array like that, but watch point on array, it's created the watch point, right? However, there's a subtle difference. It says watch point to array. What it normally says, like if I watch i, oh, no, it's not even done that. That's surprising. And if I go watch array zero, hardware watch points, right? So I've created two software watch points and one hardware watch point. The hardware watch point is almost certainly what you want because that uses the silicon, underlying silicon feature to run at full speed and stop. That was subtle. Uh, when it, when it needs to. Is that I'm out of time? Or is that like a fire alarm? Uh, anyway, so I'm gonna do one more command. So continue, I've got some software watch points and look how slow this is. Right, that's really, really slow. So you almost, uh, just beware of those, of GDP being clever and putting watch point, software watch points in there. It's not what you want. Out of time. <laughs>